Well, one of the things that happened uh, multiple times as a result of specific technologies, it would be, they would not necessarily be disruptions per se, although some of them were disruptive technologies, but they, they had, they had profound social implications. So, uh, uh, several that I'm thinking of are um, uh, refrigeration, um, laundry machines, uh, and birth control pills are just several key examples of technologies that that dramatically changed the traditional uh, uh, tasks associated with the role of associated, not perfectly, obviously, but, but traditionally associated with the role that many women uh, played, whether willingly or unwillingly, in their families and in their communities. And in the 19th century, for example, um, more cooking had to be done more frequently because you couldn't store food as well. Mm -hmm. So refrigeration had a massive impact on that. A huge amount of time was dedicated to cleaning and especially cleaning clothing before laundry machines because uh, cleaning clothing was very labor, very, very labor intensive. Um, and so laundry machines um, freed up a lot of time. Refrigerators freed up a lot of time. And in the case of birth control pills, being able to choose uh, when you do and don't have children um, gave women, of course, uh, a, a new set of options. And so a massive new possibility space opened up as a result of birth control technology. And uh, it's not that's not to say there was no prior birth control technology, but to have a very, very reliable method, namely um, hormonal birth control pills, that was that was a quite a profound shift as well. And this has been analyzed in many different through many different lenses, certainly not just uh, the lens of, of technology and disruption. But those are examples where traditional roles in society. In this case, I gave examples where the, it was it was the roles that that women had traditionally played. But many other examples could be given where roles, occupations, and tasks were completely transformed, in some cases obviated, in other cases expanded or diversified and so forth as a result of new technologies emerging and rapidly as well. These, again, these changes, you know, they, they, they you know, the, the, the transform transformative impacts can take hold in the majority of, uh, of a society within, a, certainly within a single generation. So in less than, you know, 20 years or so, and that's a, I mean, that's a, that's a breakneck pace by, you know, historical standards, looking at the larger arc of human history, of course. So these roles can transform very rapidly and tr technology is often a, a factor and certainly not the only one. And, and it may be necessary, but not sufficient, for example, in, in, in its own right, technological change. But I think we can expect much more to come, especially with the combination of uh, we were talking about transhumanism. So in other words, uh, the, the, the ability to change one's physiology, one's physical form, certainly that will have an impact because physical form is a determinant uh, and has been a determinant historically of the kinds of roles that were available that one could, that one could occupy. Um, but I think quite, quite a bit more impactful will be uh, robotics and automation and artificial intelligence. Uh, just transforming roles of all kinds and occupations of all kinds and uh, replacing humans in tasks of all kinds. And so I think we have we have a, 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 a sort of a double whammy that's coming. And um, the yeah, the, the, the roles for human beings are really open for re-examination, I think, or will open for re-examination in, in quite short order. I would certainly say within the next 15 years, we are going to be having, we are going to enter an existential crisis as a, as a civilization trying to figure out what on earth we're going to do with ourselves when, when we no longer have to, um, you know, we, we no longer have to work and have to define ourselves and our identities by our work and our occupations and the roles that we play in the economy and the, uh, in the context of production and so on and so forth. So, um, that does kind of steer things back a little bit towards AI, um, as we were talking about in previous sessions. So. Yeah, regarding that, it's interesting to note that there has been no real uptick in discussion of UBI, which I, I guess I would have predicted. Uh, we've certainly had 
very public uh, coming out of AI safety concerns and existential risk around AI. The capabilities advances are in the news constantly and people, I mean, there's plenty of politicians kind of publicly wringing their hands about impacts on jobs, although I can't really see anybody doing anything. Um, you might, given the short timeframes and uh, the potential short timeframes and the uh, how long it would take to actually organize an effective social response to mass unemployment, um, there is de facto a a kind of position uh, among governments, at least as far as I can tell, in the US and the UK and Australia, say, um, that mass unemployment is either not coming uh, or isn't something the government should worry about through new mechanisms. Um, is it just that the, the mass, that we're just coming to grips with it and uh, this is coming? I mean, a cynic would predict that there is no UBI coming, or at least not until it's sort of past time uh, where there's very widespread social unrest or something already. Um, I mean, there's already plenty of people losing jobs in copywriting as a consequence of GPT and uh, plenty more to come, presumably. Uh, like what's the what's stopping us now, right? Like the the topic of UBI really has been uh, it comes up in blog posts of, of people like the the heads of these companies as it's, it's an interesting role played by these suggestions. It's uh, not disingenuous, right? For example, I very much think Sam Altman is honestly advocating for something like a UBI uh, and. Other relevant players also, I think one should take them at their word. They, they are seriously recommending this as a um, as a policy, but it's also a little funny coming from them. Um, but why haven't we seen a broader discussion of this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah um i mean there is the 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 conversations that i follow have it continues to be mentioned it continues to be discussed but you're right also that there hasn't been a massive uptick even in communities where ubi is on the radar and it's been and it has been discussed in the past and there is a general awareness of it where you know the technological uh, uh, sort of futurism, uh, any number of discussion forums and 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 um, arenas where these things are are treated. I don't see an uptick. This is a you, you raise a very good point. Um, so in addition to it just not being on the radar really of mainstream discussion, the media isn't covering it. Politicians aren't talking about it. There's limited discussion among uh, investors or the tech crowd. Um, in, in terms of their public facing statements, just a couple of little things. It's in addition to that, I also haven't seen a huge surge in the intensity and, 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 and interest and uh, urgency of the discussion of the issue in the communities that are aware of it. And that's, that doesn't align with what I would have predicted either. So it's sort of interesting that, that, it's just not hasn't quite taken it quite it hasn't quite taken hold. It just hasn't. I mean, maybe it's just that the the impacts don't feel real enough yet, and it might need um, there may need to be some sort of uh, uh, specific occupation or job that gets rapidly obliterated for this to become very real very suddenly. And I can imagine that happening when uh, a general uh, autonomous vehicle, a general self-driving solution emerges, not a narrow one like what Waymo and Cruise and, and, and um, some of the other companies have where they're very narrowly geofenced and, and the system doesn't work very well and it's quite brittle and, it, and it, they, can, they can't drive, you can't buy one of these cars yourself and drive it anywhere you want. 
But if Tesla has its uh, has success in its stated goal, whether on Elon Elon's timeline or not, but say within the next five years, if Tesla is able to send out an update to its you know hundreds of thousands or millions of vehicle strong fleet, and some significant fraction of them do become effectively capable of being robo taxis, and and then that is you know legal. It's 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 it, it, that, in other words, the technology just is detonated like a bomb going off. That will that will I, that might be the kind of moment we would need to shock the system into awareness because millions of people make a living as a driver in the United States and around the world, but especially among Western uh, nations, there are a huge number of truck drivers in particular in the United States, and uh, that will be a, an unemployment. Um, uh, really, it, it, will, it will be a massive system shock. Um, and I, I, I don't know how, how, I don't know how much of a moment like that is necessary to trigger a national or a global conversation about UBI. But what we've seen so far clearly hasn't been enough to trigger that conversation. Just chat BT, GBT and just, you know, mid journey and stable diffusion and DALI to, they haven't been enough, despite very clearly, you know, going to put copywriters, illustrators, artists of various you know types and and, and writers of various kinds out of work uh, imminently. And and I'm sure already that process has begun. That clearly hasn't been enough. But I think putting taxi drivers and delivery drivers and truck drivers out of work would would do it. That would seem like enough of a of a crisis that uh, I would expect um, the UBI conversation to then become inevitable. Well, um, really? Yeah. I mean, would you bet on it? I would bet that when that happens, there will be lots of noise and uh, sympathetic statements made, funds put in place for re-education. There will be grants to go to community college and become job Y, which is slightly further down the timeline. Um, but is there really a political constituency for UBI? I mean, on the one hand, on the on the capitalist, I mean, we talked about AGI and politics, and I suppose this is this is in that vein. On one side, you have the you have the capitalists um, who see UBI as maybe necessary. I mean, I guess in the tech circles, there's a lot of sympathy for it. Um, but especially in the US, I have to think that UBI is probably lumped in with socialism by a lot of people. And uh, the capitalists are on the verge of somehow winning the final victory or something, right? Like AGI feels like the final victory of capital over labor. And certainly on the left, it looks like it's going to be increasingly viewed as the apotheosis of capitalism. So on the left, you, you have people, I mean, uh, I see them talking about AI quite a bit now, um, but it's mostly in the vein of like the thing we need to oppose, right? Increasingly, in, in, uh, as we've discussed, the AI safety concerns, their natural home is probably more on the left than on the right um, because of the, there's a porous boundary between AI safety and existential risk and AI ethics concerns and concerns around bias and, and so on, which are, typically thought of as being on the left. So on the left, you sort of have this concern that, well, we need to stop them from winning rather than sort of adapt to their victory. Uh, so maybe UBI doesn't seem like the first order thing you should be worrying about either on the left and on the right. Um, well, uh, I'm, I'm not sure why why it isn't more systematically considered, but what, what, we, ha what we see right now is... Uh, the usual reaction to a disruption, which is, yes, this might take away some jobs, but there will be more and better jobs. Just wait and see. Uh, Mark Andreessen just wrote a long post about his attitude towards AI and reiterated this standard line. So I, I presume we'll see increasing funding for education and the universities will gladly mop up the last remaining dollars from the middle class as they desperately try to shove their children into careers that have a future um, and uh, will pay for more professors' mansions and uh, 
Dean's holidays uh, to not much end probably. But uh, I mean, beyond investing more in education, I, I doubt there's, I mean, I, I think until, I, I think it won't even happen after taxi drivers lose all their jobs. You can add him. No, I can't. I'm here. I'm here. I'm, I'm. Well, I'm. I'm trying to disagree with Dan, but I'm in my mind. I'm not coming up with the goods. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's. Uh, yeah, the, the. I mean, predicting it. This is a dangerous business. We don't. I mean, we don't. We. My team certainly stays stays well steers well clear of trying to make any predictions about social trends or social responses, social uh, 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 dynamics have a, they, they, they have a, a severity of, or a volatility to them, I suppose, that makes them extremely difficult to forecast uh, in any way. Timing is difficult to forecast. Magnitude is difficult to forecast. Direction is difficult to forecast. You can get it all wrong so easily that, it's a it's really a fool's errand honestly to try to make any concrete predictions um and so you can make a quite a plausible case in any direction you please with these with these things and, and i don't know where i land on it i suspect if we if, i would say that if a serious national conversation or international global conversation about ubi were to occur my my guess would that it would be precipitated by some sort of technological uh, trigger, some sort of some sort of, and I hesitate to use the word disruptive because of its other connotations in my work, but some sort of um, system shock, uh, or like you know, robo taxi suddenly becoming and, and quickly and rapidly becoming a viable um, technology. Uh, it, it wouldn't if if. A, gl a global conversation suddenly took off, I wouldn't be surprised at all if it were triggered by something like that. That's not to say that it couldn't just, for reasons that are inexplicable, take off tomorrow and suddenly over the next two weeks, you know, everybody could be talking about this. Who knows? It could I mean, it, 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 sometimes these things are, well, they are, they're very difficult to, to uh, predict and there are all sorts of asterisks and wild cards. I mean, the right charismatic celebrity uh, going on the right talk show about this could trigger the conversation. So who knows? Um, <laughs> it is interesting to, to look more analytically at where the current ideological camps in terms of the, you know, the, the, the political parties in the various countries around the world, um, the various axes, I mean, a two, you know, a, a, a single dimension, a single axis political left and right is probably too too coarse to get much of a sense of what's going on in any real way. I like the at least a two axis, you know, four quadrant kind of um, at the very minimum to try to make sense of things. But it's, it would be interesting to see analytically where those various groups are, where blocks of voters are on this issue. I mean, I would be really curious to know uh, where, you know, um, authoritarian conservatives or anti-authoritarian um, uh, liberals slash progressives are on these issues. You know, I, I don't know. That would be, it would be fun to conjecture and then it would be great to see actual data. Um, the other problem, however, is that there can be very rapid swings in these things. You people, if you survey people ahead of time, they can say one thing and then, you know, the wind blows and six months later, everybody's moved to a, you know, a different, uh, position and that happens <laughs> that happens too we've seen that very often so so um, people don't know what they are going to think if you ask them ahead of time their people are not reliable predictors of their own preferences this is quite ironic but it's absolutely the case um, and uh, so I mean if you look at any technology almost any technology and you and you and if any survey or research or, or um, just casual anecdotal uh, uh, um, 
uh, data are gathered ahead of time before the technology uh, adoption you know, um, progresses, people will almost always underestimate their acceptance of that new tech, no matter what the technology is. People say, oh, I would never use that. And we've seen that time and time again. People said it about automobiles. People said it about also, well, they've said it about all kinds of food technologies and food products. They said it about the internet. I, I mean, you guys can probably remember older family members saying, well, I'll never buy anything on the internet. I, who, would, who, would, who would be crazy enough to buy something on the internet? Buy something from somebody you can't see from a place that isn't even real? Are you crazy? Right? Um, uh, and I would imagine that it would be the same in the case of UBI if you were to do widespread surveys right now, that people would underestimate their support for that. Um, Although I mean, UBI is not a technology. Well, I mean, in a way, it is. It's a social technology. But, but people might not be very reliable in predicting their own reactions to and preferences around UBI if you were to survey them ahead, well ahead of time. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the most productive kind of conversation to have, or what the most productive kind of research to do around this issue would be as a result of that. Um, I kind of suspect modeling, just simulation, would be quite compelling. One thing that I haven't seen yet that I would love to see is agent-based modeling of universal basic income um, to basically build a fairly large and fairly richly detailed Sims-like uh, simulation um, and with agents in it and, and then experiment in the simulation with a universal basic income and try to get a sense of where, where, what broad patterns of behavior emerge uh, in terms of markets, supply, demand, and so forth. Um, yeah. So yeah, uh, uh, it, it's a it's an interesting interesting question. My team does not do agent based modeling, but I would like to expand the, into that capability at some point. So if any of you guys know anybody, anybody who's great with agent based modeling, be sure to let me know. <laughs> Yeah, I've started seeing some papers using uh, from economists using instances of GPT in place of people in such models, um, fairly small scale for now. But that's based on that's some work yeah. that's come out, which uh, for some kinds of surveys, you get equivalent distributions out of surveying GPT uh, as you do surveying people. So for some purposes- Ooh, wow. You can actually substitute GPTs um, for people in terms of yeah, the kinds of questions you'd, you'd ask, um, which is, yeah, I don't know whether to be surprised or not by that exactly. But uh, so it isn't crazy that you might get reasonably realistic uh, outcomes by having networks of these things play acting being people in various situations. Uh, I, I think it's hard. It's hard to make it scientific in a way where you you sort of can trust the outcomes. I don't know. Maybe that's also true of any other kind of model you might make. And, um, but yeah, it's interesting. Definitely a direction to watch out for, um, especially if it's like a more a more dynamical systems or kind of simulation based model, but with some additional layer that's GPT like to sort of. Uh, so it's not entirely just having GPTs talk to each other um, over and over. But yeah, yeah, that seems like it will be a, an important part of economics um, going forward. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Um, I mean, I think that in my mind, the question we don't know the answer to, that we need an answer to, is about... Uh, it, it, I think that, the, yeah, the question we need an answer to that we that we don't have right now, and I think we have badly misleading information about, is uh, how many people, how many human beings are actually required to uh, perform the productive activity, to do the actual producing, 
in the industries that or in, in a in a, a full representative basket of industries so figure all of the basic industries and then some number of um, sort of secondary or tertiary layer industries of luxury goods, luxury services, nice to haves, things that aren't sort of just survival, fundamental survival stuff. And if you were to look at all of that activity and you were to look at the productivity um, through the, we've talked about some of the lenses that you can look at that through, bullshit jobs is one that we've talked about in the past. You can already start to see, I think, or, or certainly make a case that uh, societies, Western societies in particular, are uh, really quite amazingly productive when a surprisingly small fraction of the population is actually engaged mm. <clears throat> daily in that productivity, in that pr in that production process. And so I've, we've I've, we've already discussed this, but but you know uh, most children up into the age of eighteen don't contribute really contribute very little or if anything uh, to the the economic engine of productivity in their society in, in Western societies. Uh, some significant number of people are retired. Some significant number of people are uh, disabled. Some significant number of people do work that is uh, necessary but doesn't contribute directly to the production of stuff, of goods and services. So they, they create value and, and do work. For example, homemaking that is essential and super important and very difficult, but that you know, is, is basically invisible to the, the, um, the formal economy. Cough, and, mathematics research, uh, cough. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have, uh, then you have some uh, number of people who are unemployed and wish they could work and aren't working. You have some number of people who are of working age and are not seeking jobs anymore because they have exited or left or given up on um, the pursuit of employment. Uh, and then even among those people who are employed, you have some number of bullshit jobs, some fraction of jobs that are, that are bullshit. You have, you know, m lots of middle management and uh, jobs within bu bureaucracies being the sort of quintessential example of a bullshit job. And so if you take away, if you add, if you sum up all of those, <clears throat> uh, all of those people, I think the last time I went through it and tried to attach numbers, just ballpark numbers to this, it looked like it was well north of 50% of the population. So we're supporting an amazing quality of life, an amazing level of prosperity relative to, you know, 500, 1,000, 10,000 years ago. And with the smallest fraction of the population working ever, basically. And so I think we do need to get to the bottom of how many people does it really take to run an economy at a given level of prosperity. We don't know the answer to that. And, and if we don't know the answer to that, we can't answer questions like, how, how much automation do we need? Can we afford a universal basic income given the right, for example, monetary policy? Um, we don't. We can't answer those questions if we don't know what it takes to actually produce the goods and services that give quality of life to your population. Um, so I, I, it, we would we would be uh, it would kind of be putting the cart before the horse to to, to do analyses like that. So um, yeah, I, I'm I'm. This is a sort of a pet area of interest where I keep hoping I'll see some just absolutely smashing research <clears throat> emerge. That uh, especially from, for example, the U UBI crowd. I mean, there are, there are a number of scholars and and serious scholars and scientists and economists and so forth looking at this. I would love to see some real data, some real numbers, some good analysis about productivity first, and then on top of that, what that implies for UBI and automation. Um, I personally suspect it wouldn't take that much automation to make a UBI affordable, probably less than, than people would otherwise guess because we are already so fantastically productive on a per, on a um, per person basis within our societies. That's my guess, but I could easily be wrong. So just to be clear, hey. do you, I'll go ahead, Anna, uh, Matt. No, you can ask your clarifying question first. Yeah, I was just going to ask, I mean, do you buy the hypothesis that this time is just like the other times and there will be new jobs and 
plenty of them and we just continue uh, with different jobs, but these more or less the same market and employment system, or is this time different? I think this time is definitely different. I think that if we do create new jobs for people, they will be bullshit jobs. They will be, they will be monkey work jobs. They will be make work. They won't be real productivity. Uh, the, the world doesn't need 300 million YouTube influencers, <laughs> right? I mean, there are, there are a few new jobs that are genuinely new. There are a few uh, that new technology will create that were, that, that were certainly difficult to imagine prior to the technologies enabling them. But my, my uh, overwhelming inf- intuition, so I'm like 99% confident that this time, uh, if machines can think, then they can do everything that we can do. And there won't be productive additional work for human beings to do that machines can't just do that as well. And ironically, that probably is going to include YouTube influencer. I mean, there are already a few examples, uh, and certainly many in science fiction, but already a few in real life of fictitious celebrities. Uh, there's a famous pop star in Japan. I forget. Um, it's a it's a fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just a character, and and I, I can't remember the name of her name. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't. I don't. I, I think there are very very few positions that will be remain completely insulated, and it's surprised many of us. Uh, certainly art surprised people how quickly that turned out to be vulnerable, but even other things like a, a great example, just in recent weeks was research that showed that, that people feel more comfortable talking to an AI therapist than a human one because yeah. they don't feel as judged. That was a very difficult one to anticipate to see coming. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's what the data seemed to suggest that AI is going to be better at personal, deeply personal and intimate uh, medical care. Uh, so all this business about nursing and coaching and therapists and so on being uh, safe jobs and and you know you can't have you can't have the majority of society being therapists that doesn't even make any sense. Uh, but even if that were possible, it doesn't even look like that's safe as a occupation, for example. So yeah, no, I'm completely in the camp that AI that robots are coming for everything. Have a movie recommendation based on that, but uh, Matt, you go ahead. Yeah, um, I wonder if you need you need lots of people to try to become YouTube influencers in order to find the good YouTube influencers. So I wonder if you can kind of automate. So so, and this is general. Like, there's sort of. Um, uh, I forgot what the economic term for this is, but there's like um, there's like long tails in how productive individuals, the distribution of productivity in individuals. That might not be true in like all industries, but um, it seems like there are some people who are like pulling a lot of weight and creating a lot of value or are kind of crucial in the creation of a lot of um, value and other people are just kind of um, working under them and like helping them realize that value or something like that. Um, so I wonder if you need to, to achieve the levels of productivity that we're achieving. There's a component of needing to kind of search for those rock star, um, pr- product, uh, productive sort of people. Um, if that's the case, um, even if, even if you could run the economy with a very small number of people, if you knew who they were, you don't know who they are. You so you kind of have to find them slash you you know also train them and make them that productive through like the crucible of um, society, like working with other people and learning from them and stuff. So um, yeah, I wonder if that would have any effect. You can think of this as either an indirect contribution to productivity from everyone else that exists by just having been a sample from which, you know, raising the expected value of, um, of the, like when we do find someone that is hyper productive, or you can think of it as we need some way to also automate the search for the productive people, or we need the AI to be achieving 
at the level of productivity of the highest, most productive um, contributors to the economy, not just the average contributor um, to the economy. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I don't. I have to step away for just a second, guys. I'll be back shortly. Just a sure. Yeah, I'll take a stab at it. I mean, I guess I would imagine that it's more the case of the the most productive people uh, basically leveraging AI to scale their own impact, and that I mean, I think that's probably where most of the uh, resulting unemployment comes from as well. It'll just be that the most productive lawyer armed with fairly expensive law AIs can, uh, two or three of them can start a law firm uh, that can take away the business of uh, a law firm with uh, hundreds of people or certainly tens. Um, so maybe it's... Uh, So those people have to like find that economic opportunity somehow. They have to get to that position. Yeah, that's right. Um, maybe that's easier with AI. Um, well, there probably has to be a, a different education system because our, our current, yeah. I mean, even if, even if you just take the cynical view that the current education system doesn't, isn't about teaching you anything, but it's just about credentialing and talent sorting, which is not a small thing mm. at all, right? I mean, mm. how high pro um, Australia is much more productive than China, say, in part because we're just better at, I mean, I'm not better at teaching kids stuff uh, because we're not trying as hard as they are. And, that's a good thing in my view, um, but we're much, much better at uh, uh, talent sorting and then making good use of that talent once we find it. The, the last step is the place where many societies just uh, really, they can produce plenty of talent, but they, they just can't use it. Um, so mm. if we had a system that was more optimized, I mean, in the current system, you, you will find people who are good at doing tests. Um, it's much harder to recognize people who will effectively be able to coordinate with teams of AIs in some sort of rather rather alien uh, workplace compared to what we're currently doing. So I don't know, maybe, maybe there's an opportunity there for new institutions or something where um, you can demonstrate your capability in doing that. I mean, it's a similar problem to recognizing startup founders, I guess. Um, managing AIs is not going to be fundamentally that different from managing people, I would think. I would think it would be quite a bit more powerful. Uh, I mean, uh, there may be some challenges associated with managing um, m more richly complicated and complex AIs than, say, for example, GPT-4. But uh, certainly in, in early lower hanging fruit from, the, from an automation perspective, managing and coordinating entities that are less agentic, if maybe not agentic at all, and never fatigue and never tire and um, uh, you know, have, a, have a very stable error rate and um, you know, show up to work on time and, and, and so on and so forth. I mean, managing, managing robots is probably going to be uh, a utopia from a manager's perspective compared to managing a team of human <laughs> beings under <laughs> most circumstances. I mean, that th there are exceptions. I mean, if you're managing, again, you, we have to kind of distinguish, you know, different types of enterprises and different types of organizations where management is required. I mean, if you're managing the, the scientists at, you know, uh, on the Manhattan Project, that's one thing. If you're managing, you know, the the you know the closing shift at McDonald's, that's a completely different kind of, uh, you know, um, challenge because it's fr quite frankly a completely different type of population with a completely different type of, uh, you know, strengths and limitations and um, and you know, all sorts of factors that can throw wrenches into the works that management has to respond to. Um, 
And uh, uh, I, I don't know, but probably all of us have worked crappy jobs and know what it, it is like to be, uh, you know, to work a shift at a, at a, you know, retail or restaurant or whatever. And those are never very fun. Um, but uh, it, gosh, all kinds of things can go wrong when human beings are evol- involved that, you know, probably won't go wrong. No, other things will go wrong, but, but the t- typical human problems are you know, very likely to disappear with automation. And I think that will be a godsend to many industries that will make many industries just fantastically more productive and reliable. And, and um, uh, that will translate, I'm guessing, quite rapidly into some efficiency gains and cost savings and so forth. Um, and then uh, uh, another thing, Dan, that you mentioned, well, building on an, uh, just a, a second, just a, for a, a moment to build on some thoughts that I had in response to what you were saying earlier. Um, uh, <clears throat> a, a, an automated production base can... I, 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 again, I think it depends on, I think it depends on what you're struggling. I think it, well, what's a better way to say this? Um, let's put it this way. Some industries can uh, run with very limited innovation. And, and once most problems for that, for a, say, for example, a factory or a, or a business really even um, are solved, then not a whole lot of innovation and ongoing problem solving and ongoing bespoke solutions and and and, and ongoing innovation is, is necessary. There are there are in, instances where you can sort of just get a status quo uh, productivity base up and running, and then it'll run for a while. Now maybe a, a new technology or a social change will come along and will obviate that whole thing, and then it'll become uncompetitive and 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 fall apart or or fold or disappear or whatever. But I've, I've certainly seen businesses that just get set up and then they just run and then they just kind of hum along and you don't need a whole lot of uh, uh, sort of superstar innovation and problem solving and, and uh, that sort of thing on an ongoing basis once you've got things up and running. And I've seen that in individual firms. So I'm sort of having a thing, and I sort of imagine in my mind that that's possible for the in, for an entire economy, like an entire regional economy could could set up something like that. And I'll give you a real example of that. In the Gulf countries, so the the UAE, Bahrain, Qatar, uh, Oman, the, these are all examples of countries where their wealth allowed them to set up an entire economy in their society, including quite a bit of uh, basic production. These societies don't import everything. They do import supplies and raw materials, but they actually might be surprised how much manufacturing happens in these places. A lot of finished goods, especially big goods like cars and stuff are imported, but uh, there's a lot of basic industry there. A lot, I mean, you know, um, in Oman, for example, because uh, uh, I would, I, I, my wife and I ran a little business and we had a little factory in the industrial quarter of the capital city in Oman and all kinds of stuff is made there. I mean, they were making, you know, pipes and uh, all kinds of machinery for the, for uh, oil industry. And um, there was, you know, metal smelting and recycling. There was plastics manufacturing. There was, you know, there was printing um, for print books. There was food manufacturing and food processing. So every, every kind of food processing you could think of animals and plants and, you know, all that stuff. So there was all kinds of activity happening. And all of these businesses had been just established, just brought in and set up and were set up and, 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 and run, um, not by the local population because the Omanis did not have the skill base necessary to do that, but they had the resources, they had the money to pay for that uh, talent, that, that the human resources they could import, the human resources, because they had the wait, oil wait. wealth with which to they do needed so. To, they needed to import the people who knew how to actually start up the company? Yes, or, or the exactly. Workers are just and the and in yeah. many cases, it was, it was it, it, so they, they had to do two things. Number one, bring in the, the human resources necessary to set these companies up and set entire industries up in the country. Hmm. And number two, uh, it then proved in many cases cheaper to import low cost labor. And this is quite terrible, unfortunately. And this, this is uh, unconscionably 
unethical and unjust horror show in the region still to this day, my understanding is, where um, people, especially from India and Pakistan, but a number of other um, uh, countries across Asia, people are, are people come in as low wage uh, laborers, low skill, low wage, um, uh, typically the, the fits, is, is the standard description that's given for these kinds of occupations. And these are construction workers and um, people who work just, just uh, uh, what, you, what in, in the United States or other Western countries would be minimum wage jobs um, or, um, or hard uh, physically demanding jobs or high risk, you know, high likelihood of injury jobs. Those roles are also uh, not filled by the local population. They are, um, they are imported. So there's a massive imported labor force. Now, I'm sure you can see where this is going. Um, if importing a human labor force is directly analogous to purchasing a robotic labor force. So I basically already lived in countries and already seen economies running where there's a whole layer of citizen, citizens who get all this benefit of a productivity base. And all of that productivity and production, the citizenry, the national, the nationals of that country didn't set, didn't set it up themselves and they don't run it themselves, but it works. And you know, it meets everybody's needs. You know, the food gets produced and the equipment gets made and the lights are on and the water comes out of the faucet when you turn it on, it's safe to drink and all the rest of it. And so, and, and when I was living in that country in Oman, the quality of life was very high and prosperity was high and uh, you know, standard of living was high. So I can very easily see the you know uh, automating uh, uh, many of the roles that were just expatriate imported labor uh, to that society. If we could just direct one to one substitution there, basically, um, and I that's what I'm imagining we're going to see. Not that every Omani citizen had to f massively had this struggle, whether existential or practical, <laughs> to figure out like uh, how do I become a YouTube influencer? No. They get a check from the government every month. There's there. This is the thing. But I guess I should also mention this: is people say UBI has never been tried. That's nonsense. UBI is already UBI already exists in the Gulf countries, mm -hmm. or or certainly things that are very very close to it. They have social safety net and welfare stuff, and that's in addition to massive subsidization of sort of fundamental things like you know basic food stuffs and electricity and water and so forth which costs nothing in, in the Gulf countries. And may, may, things may be different now, but certainly in the 1980s and 90s and early 2000s, when I was in that region, living and working in that region, that was, you know, that was the case. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've, 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 I, think I've, I think I saw a pretty darn good preview of what's possible. Now, there were, that's not to say there weren't problems. I mean, there were, there were a lot of young people with not a whole lot of time on their hands and, you know, and, and struggle to find good, good and productive and healthy ways to use that time. But, uh, you know, but then came that's video a better games. problem to have. <laughs> oh yeah. There you go. <laughs> and then came in video games. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, I think, I think we've, we have seen some of these patterns already. And, um, so anyway, that's just a, a set of thoughts about the, the general prospect of near-term automation, you know, I mean, and then right on the heels of all of that is going to be a GI. If, if, if Dan, your suspicions are correct and, and, and it doesn't seem like it's 50 years away, and then who knows? Right. Hmm. Yeah. I wanted to make a movie recommendation. Um, I'd forgotten about this, but uh, you just reminded me, Adam. Uh, so there's a great movie called the Congress uh, came out in 2013 and it um, stars Robin Wright. Uh, the director is Ari Folman, and it's it's based on one of Stanislaw Lem's um, books, The Futurological Congress. Uh, and it's, uh, I think, it diverges from the book quite a bit if you've read it. But at the beginning, there's a uh, there's an actress who's getting a bit older, um, and she has a reputation for not being very easy to work with, and her agent. Uh, comes up with a deal where she goes into the movie studio and she agrees to have her voice and 
uh, everything about her scanned. This and this came out in 2013, right? So well before this was actually happening. Nowadays, this is actually stuff that's in contracts of movie actors. But they scanned her in 3D, recorded her voice and her acting out many different situations so that they could basically produce a generative model, we would now say, of her that they could put into movies. Um, and she signed away all future rights to that digital avatar so they could not pay her any more beyond this one-time payment. Um, and she did it in part because nobody wanted her anyway as an actress, and she had a, a son who was um, critically ill uh, she needed to support, so she went ahead and did it. Um, and then the, the movie sort of fast-forwards 20 years or something, and the world is its kind of post-singularity in a strange way. Like people are living in something like a simulation, but it's chemical-based, a bit kind of Aldous Huxley rather than Matrix. Um, and there are, like, she's extremely famous because her avatar was the was a hit and starred in a very popular TV show and everybody knows her avatar. So she's extremely famous, but has no idea really why, uh, because it wasn't really her. But she's become symbolic, and then there's like a huge battle over her, the real human, because she's uh, sort of a linchpin in like a, there's a rebellion against whatever the, the prevailing orthodoxy. Anyway, it's, um, yeah, very uh, prescient uh, story about the yeah, the uh, virtual, the virtual YouTuber. Um, it's a good movie. I couldn't see that, Matt. <laughs> Whatever it was you typed, it got censored. Yeah, that's not one I saw. I, I do have a, a sort of a vague recollection of that one, but I don't think I ever saw that one. I do remember seeing another one. I think uh, Al Pacino was in it. And it was called Simone, which is sort of a, a, um, a homonym for Sim One, and it was a, I think it was a, a, an earlier than 2013 film. It was maybe the early 2000s, mid 2000s. Don't remember exactly, but it was a similar, not similar, but it was a. Um, <clears throat> its conceit, its central conceit, was not too different. It was the that a a digitally generate you know a digitally generated character this would it wasn't a likeness of an existing person it was a sort of a whole cloth fabrication but this character um became very famous uh and it, it, it was it, I, I distinctly recall at the time thinking that is crazy that technology is a very long way off there's no way this is we're we're on the cusp of something like this, of sort of photorealistic generative imagery. Uh, and then, you know, it hasn't been, we weren't 50 years away or hundred years away from it. It turned out we were, you know, we <laughs> were really only, I mean, we were only maybe 20 years away from it. Now, let me see, when was that film? And that was a, it was okay. It wasn't a great film. I don't know if it's worth um, seeing, but if you're gonna sort of do a general viewing of films on this topic, the Congress looks like it's a, we definitely one to check out and um uh, 2002 what is that what yeah 2002 simone and it's spelled s1 m zero n e <laughs> but simone is the and yeah, al pacino is in it um here's a question why is why is our culture so stagnant given what we're talking about right i mean if indeed we're heading into uh the maelstrom and everything is going to change. Uh, it doesn't, I mean, we're talking about it in some super intellectual way, uh, but of course the industrial revolution gave us Turner and uh, the digital revolution gave us what? <laughs> 4chan, I don't know, what the fuck? Uh, I mean, why is, where are, where are these signs of what's happening in, uh, in the culture outside of, you know, talking people like what we're doing here. Uh, it's, I mean, mid journey is there, but I don't feel like, 
I don't think it's had that much impact, frankly. I mean, I've played with it. Many people have played with it. I continue to play with it. But it's maybe its novelty value passed fairly quickly. And beyond that, it's not, I mean, okay, it's one more ingredient in a workflow for visual artists and, and marketing professionals. And uh, I don't know, it's, uh, if, if there's some profound shift in the art world, uh, I probably wouldn't even see it because I'm not paying attention, but I'm not aware of that happening. Uh, ditto in in music or or film. Um, so, is it just take some time, or um, I guess what I'm saying is, if if we're if I'm right, uh, it's you know ten years to AGI or something, then. Well, things should be changing more rapidly outside of technology, or they should start too soon. Um, otherwise, maybe I don't know. There's, there's something a bit off about that prediction. I think it's. I think it's. I would. I would withhold your early judgment here in terms of the pace of change. It's just too early. It's early days, right? I mean, this is the standard. Uh, pattern you, you guys are familiar with it it's it's quite famous in cir- disruption circles i think the rand institute you know pointed it out in relation to you know um adoption of new tech and back in the 60s it's an old idea and that the idea is that that if something if you have a trend that's exponential it's very easy to overestimate uh what you think is going to happen in the short run and underestimate what you think is going to happen in the long run if you lay a linear uh, prediction over the top of it. Yeah, I'm sure you guys, you know, know what I'm talking about, and don't and, and can visualize very easily why that's the case. Um, <laughs> and I think it, it's it. We may just be in that sort of early phase where we had a splash with some of this this extraordinarily powerful new technology, and you do get sort of a, a you know. And then there's another famous thing in the hype technology hype cycle where you you, you very much you can you get a sense, a taste of what the applications might be and what the implications of those in turn will be for society and industries and the economy writ large and occupations and all the rest of it. But the shock of that is something that happens very quickly initially. And then it does take a while for the wheels to turn and for the, you know, the, the, the machinery of, of society and the economy to really reflect that, uh, that transformative new technology. And m- m- I, I suspect if, if we were to, you know, return you know, get in a time machine or, or, or you know, um, a very quick spacecraft, I guess, uh, and tr- fast forward, you know, time travel to the future a couple of years from now, if you were, you know, just snap your fingers and, arrive in 2025 or 2026, I think we would probably uh, be in a very different place where this clear signs of uh, shifts in the, in the industries affected by mid journey and chat, you know, and, and GPT four uh, would start to become very evident uh, pretty quickly, not instantly, but it's just too early. It's just too early. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, there was this profound impact in terms of like, a wake up call, but then the actual, you know, taking hold of industries and shaking people out of them. Uh, that's, that's not going to happen overnight. That's just going to take a little while longer, but then in the, it, with the wisdom of hindsight at some point in the future, you know, 10 years from now, we'll look back and we'll say, Holy moly, that all happened so fast because in the, you know, in the grander scheme of things, yeah, I mean, it will, it will occur very, very quickly. Uh, but yeah, I wouldn't second guess or doubt yourself at all at this point, Dan, it's just that it's, I mean, Jesus, it's only, it's literally only been weeks. It hasn't even been an entire year. It's it, it, since, since, you know, the bulk of these transformative new AI um, uh, products have reached the public. I mean, you guys have seen them and known about them behind closed doors as scientists and, and researchers and experts longer than the rest of us have. But holy moly, I mean, you know, it's only been since November that the, the entire world has seen what, you know, LLMs can do and what, uh, you know, generative uh, AI technology like Midjourney and and uh, Stable Diffusion can do. It just, it's just, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, 
individual companies have hiring cycles that are longer than a year. So it, it just, yeah, it's, it, <laughs> it's just, everything's happening so fast. It's still too early. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, if we were to revisit all of this five years from now, I'm, I'm guessing it'll be like, wow, that, that, if anything, it'll be, wow, that happened even faster than we thought it was going to happen. That's the typical pattern. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, yeah, I guess we should. I guess, I guess sort of soon. one more thing to think mm-hmm. about um, here in the context of UBI and the automation uh, or, or rather, you know, automation and technological unempl- unemployment resulting from automation. The, the other big question in my mind is how aggressive, how strong will the sort of protectionist responses be, and there will probably be some very strong ones in certain societies. I'm looking at Europe directly in this case. Um, uh, and how long will those withstand? How, in other words, how long can that can that be that protectionism that uh, be sustained for? I think you guys tell me, but but my suspicion is that there will be enormous pressure, social pressure from well-organized labor groups in Europe and maybe across society more generally, to simply ban the automation of tasks and occupations in order to protect both human workers and also to protect um, the occupations themselves, the integrity, the, 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 the um, perceived, if not genuine, integrity of, uh, of those occupations. And what do you mean by integrity? how well do you think that's going to work? And how big of a thing do you think it's going to be worldwide? What do you mean by integrity? Well, say, for example, uh, there is a traditional way of making some food product. I don't know, croissants or something like that, or, or, or you know, wine or something like that. And one could imagine, well, if you don't do make it by hand and you don't make it with the traditional technique, it's not the real thing. Even if it's indistinguishable taste-wise, mm-hmm. even if it's better taste-wise or more consistent, you know, in terms of quality and so forth, both of which are things that are true, I think, in the case of, certainly in the case of wine. Um, uh, nevertheless, if they, if they lack authenticity and integrity of the traditional production methods, some of which are, you know, um, mm-hmm. you know, you see things advertised, advertised as being handmade or traditionally made or, 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 you know, homemade and so forth, um, then one could imagine the perception, again, the perceived authenticity and quality of, of mm-hmm. uh, goods and services being threatened or being undermined by automation, even if this is completely irrational, which in many cases or most cases, I think it will be. Yeah, on that note, I mean, you must be aware of the Writers Guild strike in the US. Um, and Lavender has some window into that because she, she worked in the industry when we were in LA and she still knows people there, especially writers. Um, and I don't know whether it's explicit in their negotiations, but one element of this uh, strike is indeed, um, like especially the timing. Uh, does have something to do with ChatGPT. Um, so uh, the the idea that, well, as it currently stands, you're probably, <laughs> if you have any sense, not going to be using ChatGPT to literally write scripts. Um, but for example, the way that Lavender uses it is not, uh, it's, yeah, it's it's the, there isn't really a clear analogy uh, with with working before um, these kinds of tools, but it's more like um, greasing the workflow, right? And sort of you sat you sit down, you've got a bit of initial writer's block, or it's not even writer's block; it's just friction. Um, but you need to work on something, so you sort of ask it to give you some ideas, and maybe they're trash, but you, you sort of you got going, right? And you can use it in that vein over and over and over again um, because it's essentially free once you've paid the subscription. Um, Okay, now that isn't actually a job, right, that it's replacing. Uh, But it it does mean you need less writers probably because once you find good writers, they're just more productive more often. Um, And 
so the in the current system in the US, there's like a mandated number of writers you need to employ per television season, if I understand correctly. So if you have a comedy show, you need a cast of 20 writers. Even if you don't actually need them, you need to pay 20 writers. So th- like at that, that level of granularity, granularity, it's kind of baked into the system. Um, due to previous negotiations, there was another writer's, I don't know if it predates the previous writer's strike or not, but that's how the system works. And, you know, it's even if you think that well, it's kind of stupid to have 20 writers when you only need 10, um, you know, the system sort of evolves into this state. It, it has non-obvious benefits and, and sort of, you know, <clears throat> like many of the things that look like uh, inefficiencies, um, it, it works. Um, and so they're, they're striking in part to protect those arrangements, which uh, would also serve to buffer the positions of writers against the influence of things like chat GPT. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I would predict, I guess, that things like that happen quite often over the next few years where it's, it's not maybe a primary concern, but, you know, you have to renegotiate your contract with your employer every so often. For example, we're going through an enterpar- enterprise bargaining agreement with the university right now uh, and steadily concerns about automation will start to creep into those negotiations. Um, and over time, they'll become more and more important. And the timing of them will be moved forward because labor will see that, well, we have to act now or we're fucked. <laughs> um, so, yeah, clearly we'll be looking at a wave of um, like the time frame on renegotiating uh, contracts in favor of labor um, in order to lock in the current well, labor will never be more valuable than it is now, perhaps under one automation scenario, right? So that means that labor has a strong incentive to to try and ratchet up the quality of the conditions now before the negotiating power is um, decreasing. Of course, it could go the other way. Um, but yeah, it's already happening. Actually, I'm interested in your opinion on Europe. I mean, Europe looks like it's just... Uh, deliberately uh, locking itself out of the future or something with their policy moves on LLMs. Um, I don't know if maybe Chad has an opinion about that, but does does anybody here have any insight into uh, there's regulations coming down, which will basically make things like GPT-4 have to be labeled as high risk and therefore maybe not able to be used. Was it in Spain or just Italia so far? I don't remember. The yeah, account. that's right. Yeah, I think it was Italy. Is just you simply can't access it. Is that right? But I think there was an EU-wide regulation that's sort of under discussion, if I remember correctly. Hmm. Yeah, in any case, that'll, um, you can imagine that labor groups will see that as, you know, potentially something they would like to support, uh, even if it long term is suicide. Yeah, that doesn't sound very smart to me. <laughs> Because the Americans will be much more advanced and able to do things at a much faster rate. So I'm just trying to figure out if it makes sense, if it's worth doing on the long term. It just doesn't seem like. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I guess there's already a trade off that's being consciously chosen between, say, Europe and the US, or almost places in the US. Uh, where the Americans accept a certain level of brutality in their society um, and sort of dysfunction and chaos and um, discontinuity in return for the benefits of that, which are 
higher economic growth um, and being the place where things like ChatGPT start, you know, in generation after generation of technology, and it's not a coincidence. The Americans, you can correct me, Adam, if you think I'm missing the point here, but uh, somehow or other, they've they found this social contract where um, they accept that things are fucked up along many axes um, relative to things in Europe or Australia or, or almost anywhere else. Um, but it's you know it's it's kind of a accepting the variance because of the benefits on the upside. Um, so it's. That's the reason why ChatGPT is made by an American company and the reason why Silicon Valley exists and the reason why the universities in America are the best in the world. Um, it's got, well, it's overdetermined maybe. There are many other causes, but the acceptance of this dysfunction in the name of getting the upsides on the variance is the American um, trade off. And it's very hard for other countries to accept that trade off or to really even build pockets where it's allowed. Um, Europe seems systematically incapable of it. Um, Australia is maybe a little, uh, a little more along the axis towards the American side. It's not that it's not that people don't want the upside from the variance. Of course they do. Everybody says they want companies that can build ChatGPT and they want innovation and, and so on. But they they are always looking for other solutions rather than accepting the uh, the dysfunction, which is the the American way. Of doing it, um, China seems to have found their own way into that that kind of um, innovation uh, for a short period, perhaps. But would you agree with that yeah, characterization? I think that's, I think that's quite fair. I mean, I think, I'm, as you said, Dan, it's overdetermined. There are a lot of factors, I'm sure, that contribute to the to Americans culture of innovation, or at least cultural support and celebration. You know the reification of of entrepreneurship and innovation, right? The idea that that it's quite heroic. Uh, certainly, I mean, you met you met you've mentioned a number of the factors. Other ones are you know this idea that the United States is perhaps less anchored or tied to tradition. It's a place to break away uh, and you know um, uh, strike out a, a, in a new direction. Is sort of part of the the cultural mythos of the United States. So there's a sense in which innovation and challenging the, the uh, traditional ways of doing things is celebrated in a way to an extent and, and to a degree, I think that that is um, greater than, than elsewhere. Uh, I think there's also a higher tolerance for failure uh, and uh, perhaps a high, uh, that changes the risk reward calculus so it's not just that that people see the risks and they see the rewards and you know the, the, everybody wants the upside of that of the variance and wants to avoid the downside, but there's it's more than just that. There's in the United States, there's perhaps or at least in U.S. culture and especially in Silicon Valley culture, there is less stigma attached to failure than in than in than in other cultures, and that I think it turns out that turns out to be quite as quite an important cultural innovation in itself. In, in other words, it's a condition that, that, that has to become embedded in, a, in the culture uh, for innovation to really thrive. If you can't tolerate failure because you have, because it's dishonorable or you lose face or you, you know, you're, 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 you pay too high of a reputational cost and your reputation is too important for other social reasons, um, then people simply will not take the chance. They won't, even if they know the odds, they won't play the game. Um, <clears throat> Uh, in other words, even if everybody agrees on the odds and the risks and the rewards, like you do when you go into a casino, some people are just more risk averse than others, uh, and we're more worried about failing. And I think that's quite an important part of certainly Silicon Valley's. In fact, it's right there. There's like there's this mantra: of, uh, fail quickly and uh, fail early and fail often, or something like that. There's some you know saying that's part of the Silicon Valley uh, mentality, and. And then the other thing I think also is that the, the Silicon Valley in particular just has a monopoly. I mean, there are a couple of other places, but I mean, you know, it, it became the mecca for that for innovation and and startups and creating these gazillion dollar what they call them unicorn companies and so on. 
And once you've established that center of gravity, it's difficult to replicate that elsewhere it is because the, the core talent and the people who sort of are naturally inclined to that culture, to that set of values and, and perspectives, um, they're going to they're going to migrate to to that place to that center of gravity anyway. Uh, so it could probably could have been, happened somewhere else. And maybe it's it, maybe it was inevitable that Silicon Valley ended up being in America, but it, maybe it could have been somewhere else. And we would be talking about a city in Australia or a city in, in any number of other places that might have really become the cultural center of gravity for um, entrepreneurship in in built on innovation. You can do. You can have entrepreneurship built on tradition too. I mean, you can start a new, you know, um, bakery tomorrow, and that's still entrepreneurship. But I'm specifically talking about innovating with new tech, in particular. Certainly, um, uh, new ideas, maybe new fundamentally new ways of doing things, even if it isn't per se a a, a, a technology in the sense of hardware um, or or even software. You could just innovate purely in in business terms. You can come up with a new model, a new service, a new way of delivering value. Uh, but that, yeah, Silicon Valley does seem to have an edge um, for whatever reason. And then, as you also mentioned, Dan, there's this other very, very important sort of um, uh, enab fundamentally enabling condition in the United States university system, the way it's, it's uh, the way the universities were, were maybe not anymore, but were um, for, for several generations accessible uh, pretty much re irrespective of socioeconomic status. So they were just, you know, I mean, they were affordable and talent was com was was um, coming in and, you know, they were like a garden. I mean, if, if a seed blew in from outside, it doesn't matter it would, if it would germinate and grow and thrive in the U.S. universities. And uh, they were, they got great funding, um, including from governments, especially in California, the California, the UC and uh, Cal State system is really the model that the entire country followed uh, to some success, even more than the Ivy Leagues, I think. That that was certainly an incredible enabling condition. And I don't think it's a surprise that the very best of the UC, of California's universities, it's, it's, its very greatest public university is UC Berkeley. I mean, I don't think that's much in dispute. UCLA is pretty close. Uh, but Berkeley is right next door to Silicon Valley. I don't think that's a coincidence either. So... Mm. All right. On that note, we should wrap up for this week. Um, yeah. Anything we should think about for next week? Ooh, I do have a request. Mm. <laughs> it's goofy. It's cheesy, but I do have a request. Um, uh, Cause it caught my eye and it's a little preposterous, but it might be fun just to talk about quickly. And that is uh, there's UFOs in the news. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but there's this some latest round of some person in uh, who says, you know, their father's brother's nephew's cousin's former roommate told them they saw this <laughs> whatever thing in some warehouse in Nevada or something like that. Anyway, it's all hearsay and it's all a, bu a, bu a bunch of hogwash. Uh, but US, the U.S. government, the federal government, Congress is holding a few hearings and the, the Department of Defense, the Pentagon, all these, these sorts of folks are, are being typically you know, um, very characteristically uh, uh, evasive about it all. They're very recalcitrant about all this stuff. And um, the, the way in which I thought this might be fun and interesting to talk about is not to ponder how, you know, whether these things really exist. I think I, I think I can make a pretty strong case that they don't. Maybe you guys can, or maybe you have different feelings. But the reason why I think it's relevant in this context is um, uh, I, think we, I think we're starting to get a, as we approach... Uh, well, Dan, you've used this wonderful phrase, we're in the foothills of the singularity now. Um, I think we're starting to get a, a, a clearer picture that uh, some of the more extreme science fiction scenarios, science fiction imagined futures, are um, they're looking more and more plausible. And that does speak to what other technologically advanced uh, life or civilizations or, or whatever uh, entities um, in, in our universe would be like. And so that maybe is worth, you know, just kind of pondering maybe just briefly, like we could, we could, we could look anew through the lens of technology and these new things that are coming, um, especially AI 
uh, at something at things like the Fermi paradox. We could just have a quick conversation about that. We could have a conversation about the likelihood that <laughs> that there are crashed UFOs in the U.S. government's possession. I personally think that's very unlikely for a number of reasons. But anyway, I think that would be a fun thing to just just it'd be a fun, lighthearted thing to talk about. Um, so sure. if you guys are game, I think that'd be a fun conversation. Sounds fun. Yeah. Wreckage from other intelligence explosions landing on our doorstep <laughs> for us to examine and then look <laughs> at Silicon Valley and be like, hey, guys. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. And, All right. uh, yeah, Thanks, guys. See you next week. See you next week. See you.